Thank you, Leslie and choir. Take your Bible, go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. You know, uh, John, Leslie, we left here after church last Sunday driving to Jacksonville for Dave Paxton's funeral. And I saw all these young people come in. <laughs> these kids weren't even alive when he left. 17 years he's been gone. Might have been one or two, a year or two old that uh, were in there. And I'm telling you, God is faithful in every generation. That, that song said it. Amen. Thank God uh, for that. And thank you for praying for us as we went over and had Dave Paxson's funeral in Jacksonville uh, last week. Uh, Sharon's doing extremely well. I talked to her this morning, uh, Dave's... Uh, uh, dear wife, and uh, I said, the sun came up today, Dave's in heaven, Jesus on the throne. And uh, she's greatly, greatly encouraged by all of the messages that you've sent her. We're in Second Samuel 23. For these uh, seven weeks after Easter, I am preaching on the Spirit-filled life leading up to Pentecost Sunday. And so we come today after looking last week at Elizabeth. And when mama is filled with the Holy Ghost, that we come today to look at mighty men. And uh, 2 Samuel 23, and we'll be reading there from the narrative out of David's life. This is the end of David's life when you come to chapter 23. Now, these are the words of David. These are the last words of David. And you then hear him, and then the narrative picks up where he is in a battle with the Philistines down outside of Bethlehem. And we pick up the text in 2 Samuel 23 and verse 13. Then three of the 30 chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time to the cave of Adullam, while the troop of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephium. David was then in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Underline that last phrase, three mighty men. Givar is our Hebrew word, givar. It, it speaks of masculinity. It speaks of physical prowess. And it speaks of spiritual dynamic in our lives. God raised up three mighty men. This is just a, kind of an ordinary story. David's there. He's the ruler in his life. He's thirsty. He cries out, I wish I had a drink of water from the well at home. He was really more discouraged than he was thirsty. He's coming to the end. If a king needs water, <laughs> he just snaps his fingers. He gets water. He had a craving in his soul. He was down and out. Oh, if I just had a drink. He didn't just want a drink. He wanted something from home, from Bethlehem. These three guys heard it. They got together, had a committee meeting, jumped into action, broke through the Philistine line, down to the well at Bethlehem, got some, some kind of water receptacle, got a drink, brought it back to David. And he said, my Lord and my God, I can't drink this. And he poured it out like a libation, like a drink offer. I, I can't do this. These guys have risked their lives for me. These things the three mighty men did. It seems like a rather normal story. But when you read verse 18, you read of Abishai, the man that swung the spear against 300 men and killed them. He had a name the same as the three, but he did not rise to the three. Then you read in verse 20 about Benaniah. Now you talk about a linebacker. This is him right here. Benaniah, uh, he was a valiant man. He killed two sons of Errol of Moab. He went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. He also killed an Egyptian. He snatched the spear from his hand, went down, got the club out of his hand, and he killed the Egyptian. All these things Benaniah did, but he did not rise 
to the three. There's something about these three water fetchers that God puts in a category of excellence, of exaltation. They did a simple task. They were men of submission, service, sacrifice. They gave their all, but they were mighty, mighty men. Give our. They, they had the power of the Holy Ghost on them and within them as they went forward to do the work of holy God. A few of you in this room will know why this narrative means so much to me and why I pick it on this uh, encouragement weekend. Friday night we met with uh, pastors and wives and other staffers and poured into them and encouraged them. Tonight we have a guest speaker uh, Vance Pittman, he sits right here to my left, and uh, Brother Vance is going to preach for us tonight. You want to know him from Las Vegas, uh, and now stepping into a role of planting churches across America, literally around the world, with a North American mission board. We're grateful, Vance, that you're here, and he's going to encourage us tonight. And that's, that's what this weekend is about. And that, don't miss 5.30 tonight. Choir will be down there. It's, it's just going to be a great time as we gather together, and it'll be a great time of encouragement. But this story means something to the pastor because of what happened 25 years ago this coming Thursday. The 19th day of May, I have it written right here in my Bible, May 19, 1997, right next to this text. I was in my seventh year pastoring this church. We'd just built this building. We'd just moved in here not many months. And I made a leadership decision. It was not well received by some, uh, well received by others. Uh, it's not easy to lead. Our good friend Johnny Hunt has a brand new book out about uh, leadership, and the first chapter is entitled, It Ain't Easy. <laughs> uh, well, if you're going to lead, it ain't easy, all right? Uh, that's truth. It may not be good English, but it's, uh, it's true. It's just not easy if you're going to lead anything. And it got hard in 97 for me. I'd made that choice. Matters not what it was. It was just not taken well <clears throat> with everyone. A gentleman came to see me. He's a leader in his church. He'd been in his church over 50 years at that time. He's uh, buried and gone to heaven now. Gentlemen, he made an appointment, come talk to me about this decision. And when he showed up, he brought 30 people with him. I was looking for one guy. Uh, when you have to move a, a meeting out of the pastor's office in the Sunday school room, it's not going to finish well. You understand what I'm talking about? And it, it was not good. It got kind of nasty. Uh, then we went to the mailbox, and my wife got mail. It was addressed to Jezebel Trailer. Huh. Yeah. And the return address had one word. Legion. Legion. And they told my wife what all she was doing wrong. And, of course, no one signs those kind of letters. We took it in the backyard and burned it, sent it back to hell where it came from. But that'll hurt your soul. I tried to leave. I wanted to leave. I, I, I'd never ask anybody to recommend me till then. I, I just, I'd call my friends. i said, can you get me out of here? I said, just find me somewhere to go. I can remember writing in my journal. I said, Lord, I'll go to Toad Suck, Arkansas if you send me there. I didn't even know if that was a real place. I just heard Junior Hill say it. And, and uh, I, I looked it up. It really was. And uh, I always wanted to see the stationery, the First Baptist Church of Toad Suck. I just thought that green paper looked pretty cool, you know. And I couldn't move. God wouldn't let me out of here because he had me on the potter's wheel. And he was knocking everything out of me that wasn't Jesus. It wasn't about my decision. It was about me. This was a pruning time. This was a cutting back in my life. It was a test. 
accusations came. I was accused of stealing money, using it for personal gain. It was nasty. It just got hard. And then on the 19th day of May, I came home to my house. My daughter was with Liz, my wife, and they were somewhere, and I had young Bennett with me. As we pulled in, there was a car parked down by our mailbox. I'm going to that mailbox next Thursday and have a prayer meeting. I sold that house, but I'm going to go ask the owner if I can have a prayer meeting in front of that mailbox Thursday. That car was parked there, and I didn't know whose it was. I put Bennett to bed, and I walked down. And when I got to that car, three men got out. I said, what are you guys doing? And I said, whose car is this? They said, well, we rented the car this morning. And we've been on a little trip. I said, what? They said, well, Pastor, you, you told us that when you grew up in your little town in Pisgah, Alabama, that the artesian well fed the whole town. I said, yeah, there's a spring there, and it feeds the whole city. One of them looked at me and said, have you ever read 2 Samuel 23? I said, well, I've read the whole Bible, but I don't have it memorized. You're going to have to help me a little bit here with reference. And they said, David, the men, the well. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. They're fighting the Philippians. And the three guys went and got the water. They said, well, we left here this morning early, and we drove 350 miles to Pisgah, Alabama. We talked to your mother and daddy. And we drove back. We've been here waiting on you. And they reached over in the back seat of that car. And they got out a quart fruit jar and said, we've brought you a drink of water from your well in Pisk. I said, you did what? I've never shown this picture till this weekend. My mother and father ran the water into the jar. Mother standing at the kitchen window the water comes out of the well in the backyard and those guys told me when they told my daddy while they were there he fell on his face and wept and prayed and cried and then they told the story of what they were doing and one of the men told me said I bet your mother ran that water for five minutes in that jar wanting it to be just right and they brought me that quart fruit jar and gave me that water. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I've never been so encouraged in my life. I mean, these guys drove 700 plus miles to get water. Just symbolically to bring it back to say, we love you. They said, Pastor, we brought you one other thing. I said, well, what? He said, you used to tell us when God called you to preach, you'd go out to the gorge. Pisgah means a high rocky ridge. It's like where Moses is on Mount Pisgah. He could see over in the promised land, but he, he wasn't going, but he could see. Well, when you stand on the rock in Pisgah, you can see the Tennessee River coming out of Tennessee. It runs down in North Alabama. And I'd go lie down on that big rock. And they went out there, had my daddy take them to that rock. And they took a hammer and broke off two pieces of rock. You can just about hold them in your hand. I have them planted outside my house, just about a mile from here. Every now and then I go out there and just put one foot on one rock on the other. And they gave me those rocks and said, Pastor, this is the rock where God called you. He'll be the chief cornerstone. If you'll stay on the firm foundation, God will see you through. And they said, we brought you one more thing. I said, oh, what? They pulled out a two-pound Maxwell House coffee can, old metal, rusted, and they had rhododendron flowers stuck down in it. They'd cut it off. I said, did you not see the sign? They said, we saw the sign because they're all over the side of that mountain. It said, $50 fine for cutting rhododendron flowers. It's all over there. They said, we saw it. Our pastor taught us it was easier to get forgiveness than permission, so we just cut them off of there, they said. 
and we'll pay the fine if we have to. I have a picture of those rhododendron in full bloom there in my office. If you ever come in and see me, it's right up on the credenza. You'll see those flowers, picture of those flowers. There are three men. I've never told their name. I will not tell their name until they die. One of them has died, and I shared this at his funeral. The other two still living, and I've never uttered their name to anyone. I have people all the time say, is it him, 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 him? And I'm just telling you, these men are unnamed in this text. And I believe that the Spirit of God told us, if we ever told her name, that the anointing would go off the illustration, nobody would get blessed later. So I've never said that. But God's given me liberty when they die, and one of those guys was Dennis Wilson. Some of his family's in this room. I saw his granddaughter sitting right over here a while ago. Big D, I called him. Big guy. Rossville, Georgia. Biggest Tennessee fan other than John Tyner I've ever met in my life. Big. Left-handed golfer. Hands like this. Dennis walked to me and put his hand on my face. He said, would you be quiet for just a minute? I said, I'll try, D. He said, we want you to know, the three of us, we've been talking all day. We want you to know that if you're ever in trouble anywhere in the world, if you call one of us, the other two, we'll call, that one will call the other two, and we'll come to your aid wherever it is. And we want you to know, Pastor, and listen to this. They said, we are willing to die for you. We're willing to lay down our... And he said, don't get the big head. It's not because of who you are. He he said, you're the under shepherd, and we believe God has set you here, but we're willing to stand between you and any trouble. If anybody's going to get to you, they're going to have to come through us. We're willing to lay down our life. We'll die if need be for you. Well, I I can't tell you how encouraged I was. Just know this. Had they not gone there, I would not be standing here today. If those men had not been mighty men and gone, I wouldn't be. I don't know. I may have quit. I don't know what I'd have done. I'd have gotten out of Dodge if I could. But they went there, therefore I stand here today. Boy, those guys so encouraged me. Those rocks, water, flowers. Just a simple act. But what made them go do that? They heard the Spirit of God. They thought they would look silly doing it, but they were obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit within their life. And I, I, heaven will only record the number of times I've preached a sermon about this particular message, but the sermon I've preached out of this over and over and over, literally around the world where people have been encouraged and blessed and God's raised up mighty man after mighty man after mighty man. So they blessed me and encouraged me. They got ready to leave and they got in the car and they didn't go 15 feet and the brake lights came on and I looked over and Dennis was in the back and they rolled the window down. He stuck that big head out. Huge man. He said, oh yeah, one other thing we, we forgot to tell you. We're far, you but if you ever become a liberal or sleep with the wrong woman, the three of us will kill you. <laughs> if I ever told the truth, I'm telling it right now. I'm just telling you, that's what Dennis said. I, I, and I took it, the other two were in on it, but that, that's what he said. And so every time I even think about doubting the Scripture, Vance, I, I say, uh-uh, I'm sticking with the stuff. Amen. And because they did that, I said, these are mighty men. Olive, what we need are mighty men. We need Gavar. Manly men, yes. Physically, yes. But spiritually, we need men that are filled with the Spirit of God so they can walk in the power of God to do the things of God. Hear me, graduates. The most important thing that can ever happen in your life is that you come to the end of yourself and the beginning of the holiness of God. There is a great difference in an education and intelligence. 
There's a great difference in knowing what man teaches and what God can teach you. You need them both. Oh, the Spirit of the living God within us. And God's looking all over this room today and online. and every, He's saying, I'm looking for a mighty man, a mighty man, a mighty man. How do you find one? Well, let me give you four simple things today, three of which are negative, and the last is positive. Then we give an invitation and invite you to come to Christ. How do you become that mighty man of God? Like these three simple men in 2 Samuel, like those three friends of mine, what I call the water fetchers in my life. And let me just share these with you. Number one, fearful people quench the Spirit of God. You don't want to quench the Spirit of God. Fearful people quench the Spirit of God. First Thessalonians 5 in verse 19 tells us, do not quench the Spirit. That's the only time that word is ever used in the New Testament, quench, right there. It literally means to extinguish the fire. Do not extinguish the fire. When you see God at work, don't be the cold water committee. Bring the gasoline. Don't quench the spirit. Fearful people, when you you get scared that it's going to be larger than you and that God's going to call you to do something you're afraid of, let me tell you, God's got you right where he wants you. Get out of fear and into faith. I was just a high school kid. God called me to preach. Man, I was fearful, but God said, do it by faith. The man that was preaching that night when I came forward sits in this service today. Right there. Doc, how you doing? Good to see you. Dr. Turner's preaching that night, and I walked forward. I went home and told my daddy, I believe God's called me to preach. He is brushing his teeth. He threw the toothbrush in the bowl, wiped his mouth, and said, say what? I said, I believe God's called me to preach. He said, well, if you know what God's got for you to do, you better get about doing it. It's the greatest piece of advice I've ever received in all my life. If you know what God's got for you to do, you better get about doing it. Cast fear aside, begin to walk by faith. Fearful people quench the Holy Spirit. Secondly, bitter people grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 30 and 31. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. I'm telling the very first word I believe is the key one in this text. Bitterness is what causes people to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's the heavy sorrow with no joy. No joy. They gri- I have people from time to time, so you know, the Holy Spirit speaks. He doesn't ever whisper. Well, you don't know God. He speaks with a still, small voice, and you can easily grieve Him when you have a bitterness in your heart. If you won't forgive and move forward, if you've never read R.T. Kendall's book on total forgiveness, you've got to do it. If you've got anybody that's bothering you about something that's happened in the past, I challenge you, I double dog dare you to read that book. You'll fall on the floor. R.T. says you just don't have to forgive. You you must then begin to pray for God to bless the people that hurt you and you've not forgiven totally until you do. You read read the Sermon on the Mount and you'll find it all through it. You've got to bless those that persecute you. I can say I forgive if you just don't ever make me talk to them again. (laughs) And God says you got to bless them. Fearful people quench the Spirit. Bitter people grieve the Holy Spirit. Lost people resist the Holy Spirit. Stephen's preaching that powerful message in Acts 7. And he said, you men are stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart. You are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Lost people resist. Why? Because they have an uncircumcised heart and ears. They, They don't feel within their soul. They don't hear. And they say no to the things of God. When you resist the Holy Spirit, Spirits. What lost people do? The Spirit of God comes to some of you again and again and again. He says, Come, come, come. Trust me. He said, No, 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 not today. Next week, preacher. I do it next week, not this week. But we resist. What you need to do is throw open the heart and say, Oh God, come. Do what you want to do within my life. 
You'll not be a mighty man in the Spirit of God if you resist the Spirit of God. Don't quench, don't grieve, don't resist. Number four, surrendered people are filled with the Spirit. Amen. When you are surrendered, you'll be filled. Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine. How many people in here have been drunk? That's not rhetorical. How many people in here have been drunk? All right. Yeah, okay. There'll be some counseling sessions next week. Uh, not for you, but for your wife that just found out that you have done that. Now, you're, if you've ever been drunk, then drink has controlled you. You can't walk a straight line or say a straight word. Don't be drunk. Don't, don't get drunk that, with wine. That's dissipation. But be ye pliruo. Be pliruo. Be filled. On the top of your head, the bottom of your feet. Be filled to the fullness, the plethora. All of you filled with the Spirit of God. In Ephesians 6, 10, finally, 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 the last thing he says, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his, there's our word, in the strength of his what? His might. His might. It's when you hear God that you obey God and you trust God. Do, do you know those three guys that went and got that water for me? Do you, do you understand how silly, how silly they would have thought they were going? What, what if we go do this and it just winds up nothing? We, we drove all that way, did a silly act. You see what they heard, God? Then they took a step and obeyed God. And then they trusted God. Say, Pastor, I'm ready. How, how do you surrender? I was with my friend Steve Gaines a few days ago. Pastor's Bellevue Church in Memphis. Dr. Gaines has always got a scripture to share. And there was three or four of us in a small group. He said, boys, have you all read that? Then he gave us a verse over in Isaiah. He said, the peace of God, some of his members here today, the peace of God it comes when you trust the Lord. JT, you may have been there when he shared this illustration. He did it in his own church. He said, to trust the Lord means to follow fall before. And here's what Steve did right in front. He said, this is how you trust the Lord. When you come to the place, you're sold out. It's not about you all about it. And, and you are at his disposal, fully given unto him. And, and you say, Lord, I trust you with my every... God's ready to raise you up. He's ready to take a senior student and use you for the glory of God as a mighty man or a mighty woman. He's ready to raise you up, but he's looking for you to sell out. Come to the end of yourself and the beginning of the Lordship of Christ. And when he finds that, oh man, all the brain power that's here, the emotional strength that's in it, you got to lay all that aside and say, oh God, Use me. I surrender. And you fall before his feet. Every mother and dad, same way. Every one of us. That's when God begins to move. When we come to the end of ourself and the beginning of the Lord. There's two kinds of preachers. There's humble preachers. And there are those that are going to be humble preachers. <laughs> you, you full of yourself, I'm here to tell you God's going to deal with you. I don't know the time or how, but I'm telling you, it, it's those broken vessels that he uses that are broken and poured out, and then God begins to raise them up to the glory of Almighty God. I've been pastoring this church seven years. We were on a great run in seven years. We were over there in the other building, we two services, and we had to go to three services. All oh, people come in, joining, being baptized. That place was full. On Sunday night was the greatest church in the world. You, you couldn't hardly get in. People have to save you a seat. Oh, it was. 
And I got to thinking, I, I ain't bad. I ain't bad. You know, that, we're doing all right. People come, want to do a conference, ask you how you do it. Well, I didn't know. You'd have to have me to have it happen. So the Lord decided to put me on the potter's wheel. And I'm just telling you, he is knocking everything out of me that was not Jesus. If I arrive, oh goodness, no. He, he takes me back to the potter's wheel every now and again. Mm. Broken. You got to get over you. Surrender. And the Spirit of the living God will take you as a vessel, an honorable vessel, fill you up and use you for His glory. Some of you in this room today need to come to this altar this morning and just get on your face and say, Lord God, have your way in my life. I don't know what the next step is for you. Some of you, it's to trust Jesus. As you say, you've never been saved. Today, today's the day. You say, Pastor, don't resist. I'm, you can walk out of here resisting if you want, but the best thing you can do is surrender. Let God save you and change you and fit you for heaven. Some of you say, well, I don't know if I want to be a part of this. And God calls you. You come and you link your life with our family. Some of you, God's called the ministry, called to preach the gospel, called to go to the ends of the earth. Some of you don't need to come here. You need to go talk to Vance and say, I'm ready to go plant a church. He'll help you with that. Tell you the next steps to take. All to thee I now surrender. Father, draw us to yourself. God, save our friends in this room, at home. Lord, grow the church, add to it. Call out the call. Give us mighty men. Mighty men that would hear and obey and trust. Go the way that you'd have them go. We give you this invitation now. I pray, Father, and thank you for those that are going to come.